Hello all, I am here, Dr. Annette Ferovich. I'm the teacher, we're here in the reading room, and we are getting through our book, which I love. I love this book, The Sign of the Beaver. I don't know why you had to call it, Ugh, whatever. We're on chapter seven in this great book. Before he had his eyes open next morning, Matt knew that something was wrong with this day. When it came back to him, he sat up with a groan. Atin, what had pro possessed him to give a book to an Indian? How could he possibly teach a savage to read? He tried to think back to the time his mother had taught him his ABCs. He could plainly see that brown covered primer she ha held in her hands. He had detested it. He had had to learn the short verses printed beside each letter. A, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. That would hardly do. To be honest, he wasn't sure to this day just what it meant. He would feel mighty silly trying to explain it to a heathen. Then happily, he recalled another book that had been sent to his sister, Sarah, from England with a small picture to illustrate each letter. No nonsense about Adam. A was for apple. Sarah had been luckier than he. But he had no way of making pictures and there were no apples here in the forest. What could he find for A that an Indian would understand? He looked about the cabin, T for table, though it was unlikely they'd ever get as far as T. How about A for arm? That was simple enough. B, his eye fell on the leg bone of the squirrel left last from last, last night's meal. The stub of a candle would do for C. D, door would be just the word for a teen. He certainly could walk out of one fast enough and would again, no doubt, long before they got to D. He doubted that a teen, a teen would come. Still, he had better be ready. He stirred the fire, ate a chunk of the cold Indian corn cake, and set about to prepare a schoolroom. He shoved the two, two stools together and laid Robinson Crusoe on the table. He did, not, he did not have paper or ink. He found a ribbon of birch bark in a corner and tore off a strip and sharpened a stick to a point. Then he waited. A teen came, swinging a dead rabbit by the ears. He slung it disdainfully on the table. Thank you, Matt said. That's a big one. I won't need anything else for several days. His politeness brought no response. Sit here, he ordered. He hesitated. I never thought as how I'd have to teach anyone to read, but I have figured a way to start. Silently, the boy sat down, as straight and rigid as a cedar post. When Matt hunched himself onto the other stool, the boy's scowl deepened. Plainly, he did not like having the white boy so close to him. Atene had no need to be finicky, Matt thought. He smelled none too sweet himself. The grease smeared on his body, even on his hair, stunk up the whole cabin. It was supposed to keep off the mosquitoes, he'd heard, but he thought he'd rather have the pesky insects himself. He drew a letter on the birch bark. This is the first letter, he explained. A. A for arm. He repeated this several times, pointing to his own arm. Atina kept his stubborn, scornful silence. Matt set his jaw. He could be stubborn, too, he decided. He opened Robinson Crusoe. We'll pick out the A's on this page, he said, trying to control his impatience, he pointed. Now you show me one. A teen stared straight ahead of him in silence. Then, to Matt's astonishment, he grudgingly laid a grubby finger on a letter A. I remember when I told my kids to do something, and it surprised me when they did it like that, too. But they did it. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. Nice job, Matt. Good, said Matt, copying the word Sackness, Sackney's used so often. Find another. Suddenly the boy broke his silence. Silence. White man's book foolish, he scoffed. Right arm, 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 all over paper. Puzzled at first, Matt saw his own mistake. Hundreds of other words begin with A, he explained, or have A in them. And there are 25 more letters. A teen scowled. How long? He demanded. What do you mean? How long a teen learns signs in book? It'll take some time, Matt said. There are a lot of long words in this book. One moon? One month? Of course not. It might take a year. With one swift jerk of his arm, 
A teen knocked the book from the table. Before Matt could speak, he was out of the cabin and gone. Reckon that's the end of the lessons, Matt said to himself. Cheerfully, he began to skin the rabbit. Chapter 8. By the next morning, he was half sorry the boy could not be coming again. He didn't know whether he was annoyed or relieved when a teen walked through the door without a sign of greeting and sat down at the table. Matt decided to skip B for bone. In the night, he had thought of a better way. This book isn't a treaty, he began. It's a story. It's about a man who gets shipwrecked on a desert island. I'll read some of it out loud to show you. He opened Robinson Crusoe at the first page and began to read. I was born in the year 1632 in the city of York. He stopped. He remembered suddenly how the first time he had tried to read this book, he had found that first page so dull he had come close to giving up right there. He had better skip the beginning and get on with the story if he wanted to catch a teen's attention. I'll read the part about the storm at sea, he said. He had read the book so many times that he knew exactly where to find the right page. Taking a deep breath as though he were struggling in the water himself, he chose the page where Robinson Caruso was dashed from the lifeboat and swallowed up in the sea. Nobody can describe the confusion of thought which I felt when I sunk into the water, for though I swam very well, yet I could not deliver myself from the waves so as to draw breath. For I saw the sea come after me as high as a great bill and as furious as an enemy. Matt looked up from the page. There was not a flicker of interest in the boy's face. He had understood a single had he understood a single word? Discouraged, he laid down the book. What did a storm at sea mean to a savage who had lived all his life in the forest? Well, he said lame, lamely, it gets better as you go along. Once more a teen took him by surprise. White man get out of water? He asked. Oh, yes, Matt said, delighted. Everyone else on the ship is drowned. He gets thrown up all alone on an island. The Indian nodded. He seemed satisfied. Shall I read more of it? A teen nodded again. Go now, he said. Come back. Seba. The next morning, there was no question of B for bone. Matt had the book open and waiting at the part he wanted to read. This is about the morning after the storm, he explained. Robinson Crusoe looks out and sees that part of the ship hasn't sunk yet. He swims out and manages to save some things and carry them to shore, he began to read. Once again, it was impossible to tell whether a teen understood. Presently, Matt slowed down. It was discouraging reading to a wooden post, but a teen spoke at once. White man not smart like Indian, he said scornfully. Indian not need thing from ship. Indian make all things he need. Make all thing he need. Disappointed and cross, Matt put the, book, put the book down. They might as well get on with the alphabet. He drew a B on the birch bark. After a teen had gone, Matt kept thinking about Robinson Crusoe and all the useful things he had managed to salvage from that ship. He had found a carpenter's chest, for instance, bags of nails, two barrels of bullets, and a dozen hatchets. A dozen! Why, Matt and his father had come up here to Maine with one axe and an adze. I don't know what that is, A-D-Z. They had cut down trees and built this whole cabin and the table and the stools without a single nail. Caruso had found a hammock to sleep in instead of prickly hammock, hemlock bows. He could see now how it must have sounded to a teen. Come to think of it, Robinson Caruso had lived like a king on that desert island. Chapter 9 a few, more, a few mornings later, at the end of the lesson, Matt delayed a teen. How did you kill that rabbit, he asked, pointing to the offering a teen had thrown on the table. There's no bullet hole in it. India not use bullet for rabbit, a teen answered scornfully. Then how? There's a hole. There's no hole at all. For a moment, it seemed that a teen would not bother to answer. Then the Indian shrugged. A teen show, he said. Come. Matt was dumbfounded. It was the first sign the Indian had given of, well, of what exactly? He had not sounded friendly, but there was time, not time to puzzle this out right now. A teen was walking across the clearing, and he apparently expected Matt to follow. Pleased and curious, Matt hobbled after him, grateful that he no longer needed the crutch. At the edge of the clearing, the Indian stopped and searched the ground. Presently, he stooped down under a black spruce tree, poked into the dirt, and jerked up a long snake-like root. He drew from the leather pouch at his belt a curious sort of knife. The blade curved into a hook with one sure stroke. 
He split one end of the root, then peeled off the bark by pulling at it with his teeth. He separated the whole length of two strands, which was spliced together by rolling them against his bare thigh. Next, he searched about in the bushes till he found two forked saplings about three feet apart. Saplings are little trees. And forked would be like this. He trimmed the twigs from these, drawing his knife toward his chest as Matt had been taught not to do. Then he cut his stout branch and rested it lightly across the forks of his saplings. From the thread-like root, he made a noose and suspended it from the stick so that it hung just above the ground. So a noose is what a person hangs like that, right? He worked without speaking, and it seemed to Matt that all this took him no time at all. Rabbit run into trap, he said finally. Pull stick into bush so white boy can kill. Golly, said Matt filled with admiration i hadn't thought of making a snare i didn't know you could make one without string or wire make more a teen ordered pointing into the woods not too close after a teen had gone matt managed to make two more snares they were clumsy things and he was not too proud of them splitting a slippery root he discovered was not so easy as it looked he spoiled a number of them before he mastered the trick of splicing them together they did, not slide, they did not slide as easily as the one a teen had made, but they seemed strong enough. Next morning, he showed his traps to a teen. He had hoped for some sign of approval, but all he got was a grunt and a shrug. He knew that, a teen, he knew that to a teen, his work must look childish. However, on the third day, one of his own snares had been upset, though the animal had got away. The day after that, to his joy, there was actually a partridge struggling to free itself in the bushes where the stick had caught. This time, the grunt with which a teen rewarded him sounded very much like his grandfather's good. Silently, the Indian watched as Matt reset the snare. Then they walked back to the cabin, Matt swinging his catch as nonchalantly as he had, had seen a teen do. How wonderful would that be? See the difference there? Right, when you go and you conquer other cultures, you don't ever learn and imagine, because kids don't care, right? If you're my neighbor and you wanna play the same game I do, or you wanna teach me a game that I think is really cool, we're friends forever, right? We're, yeah, we're friends forever. You don't need to bring me any more food, he boasted. I'll catch my own meat from now on. Nevertheless, a teen continued to bring him some offering every morning. Not always fresh meat, he seemed to know exactly when Matt had finished the last scrap of rabbit or duck. Sometimes he brought a slab of corn cake or a pouch of nuts, once a small cake of maple sugar. Plainly, he felt bound to keep the terms of his grandfather's treaty. Matt stuck to his part of the bargain as well, though the lessons were an ordeal for them both. Matt knew well enough what a poor teacher he was. Sometimes it seemed that a teen was learning in spite of him. Once the Indian had resigned himself to mastering 26 letters, he took them in a gulp, scorning the childish candle and door and table that Matt had devised. Soon he was spelling out simple words. The real trouble was that a teen was contemptuous, that the whole matter of white man's words seemed to him nonsense. Contemptuous means hateful. So, uh, a teen was hateful. Impatiently, they hurried that the whole matter of the white man's word seemed to him nonsense. So he was hateful because it seems like it's nonsense. What do I need to learn this for? I, I want to learn. I, I learned how to trap. I showed you how to live. I showed you how to make things. And yet you want to teach me these words. What do I need to know that for? Impatiently, they hurried through the lessons to get with Robinson Caruso. Matt suspected that the only reason the teen agreed to come back day after day was that he wanted to hear more of that story. Skipping over the pages that sounded like sermons, Matt chose the sections he liked best himself. Now he came to the rescue of the man Friday. A teen sat quietly, and Matt almost forgot him in his own enjoyment of his favorite scene. There was a mysterious footprint on the sand, the canoes drawn up on the lonely beach, and the strange wild men the strange, wild-looking men with two captives. One of the captives they mercilessly slaughtered. The fire was set blazing for a cannibal feast. 
Then the second captive made a des desperate escape, running straight to where Caruso stood watching. Two savages pursued him with horrid yells. Matt glanced up from the book and saw that a teen's eyes were gleaming. He hurried on. No need to skip here. Caruso struck a mighty blow at the first cannibal, knocking him senseless. Then, seeing the other was fitting an arrow into his bow, he shot and killed him. Matt read on. Matt read on. The poor savage who fled but had stopped, though he saw both his enemies had fallen, yet was so frightened with the noise and fire of my peace that he stood stock still and neither came forward nor went backward. I bellowed, I think that's hollowed, hallooed again to him and made signs to him to come forward, which he easily understood and came a little way, then stopped again. He stood trembling as if he had been taken prisoner and just been to be killed as his two, and just been to be killed as his two enemies were. I beckoned to him again to come to me and gave him all signs of encouragement that I could think of and he came nearer and nearer, kneeling down every 10 or 12 steps. In token of acknowledgement for saving his life, I smiled at him and looked pleasantly and beckoned to him to come still nearer. At length he came close to me and then he kneeled down again, kissed the ground and taking my foot, set it upon his head. This, it seemed, was a token of swearing to be my slave forever. A teen sprang to his feet, a thundercloud wiping out all pleasure from his face. Nada, he shouted. Not so, Matt stopped, bewildered. Him never do that. Never do what? Never kneel down to white man. But Caruso had saved his life. Not kneel down, a teen repealed, repeated fiercely. Not be slave. Better die. Matt opened his mouth to protest, but a teen gave him no chance. In three steps, he was out of the cabin. Now he'll never come back, Matt thought. He sat slowly turning over the pages. He had never questioned the story. Like Robinson Crusoe, he had thought it naturally and right that the wild man should be the white man's slave. Was there perhaps another possibility? The thought was new and troubling. Chapter 10, we will start when we come back tomorrow, Wednesday, in the classroom in the reading room. Thanks for joining me. I'm Dr. Annette Farovich. I appreciate you being here and I will see you tomorrow in the classroom.